Chapter 6 of Dinosaurs, with special reference to the American Museum Collections by William Diller Matthew. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Jeffrey Smith, New Orleans, Louisiana. Chapter 6 The Beaked Dinosaurs order orthopoda ornithischia or predentata the peculiar feature of this group of dinosaurs is the horny beak or bill the bony core sutured to the front of the upper and lower jaws was covered in life by a horny sheath as in birds or turtles but this is not the only feature in which they came nearer to birds than do the other dinosaurs. The pelvic or hip bones are much more bird-like in many respects, especially the backward direction of the pubic bone, the presence of a prepubis, in the number of vertebrae co-ossified into a solid sacrum, in the proportions of the ilium and so on various features in the anatomy of the head shoulder blades and hind limbs are equally suggestive of birds and it seems probable that the earliest ancestors of the birds were very closely related to the ancestors of this group of dinosaurs but the ancestral birds became adapted to flying the ancestral predentates to terrestrial life and in their later development became as widely diversified in form and habits as the warm-blooded quadrupeds which succeeded them in the age of mammals these beaked dinosaurs were so far as we can tell all vegetarians unlike the birds they retained their teeth and in some cases converted them into a grinding apparatus which served the same purpose as the grinders of herbivorous quadrupeds it is interesting to observe the different way in which this result is attained in the mammals the teeth originally more complex in construction and fewer in number are converted into efficient grinders by infolding and elongation of the crown of each tooth so as to produce on the wearing surface a complex pattern of enamel ridges with softer dentine or cement intervening making a series of crests and hollows continually renewed during the wear of the tooth in the reptile the teeth originally simple in construction but more numerous and continually renewed as they wear down and fall out are banked up in several close-packed rows the enamel borders and softer dentine giving a wearing surface of alternating crests and hollows continually renewed and reinforced from time to time by the addition of new rows of teeth to one side as the first formed rows wear down to the roots footnote trachodon teeth never drop out they are completely consumed only in the iguanodonts and ceratopsia are they shed b brown end of footnote this is best illustrated in the trachodon the other groups have not so perfect a mechanism a the iguanodonts iguanodon camptosaurus suborder ornithopoda or iguanodontia 
in the early days of geology about the middle of the nineteenth century bones and footprints of huge extinct reptiles were found in the rocks of the weald in southeastern england they were described by mantell and owen and shown to pertain to an extinct group of reptiles which owen called the dinosauria so different were these bones from those of any modern reptiles that even the anatomical learning of the great english paleontologist did not enable him to place them all correctly or reconstruct the true proportions of the animal to which they belonged with them were found associated the bones of the great carnivorous dinosaur megalosaurus and the weird reconstruction of these animals based by waterhouse hawkins upon the imperfect knowledge and erroneous ideas then prevailing must be familiar to many of the older readers of this handbook life-size restorations of these and other extinct animals were erected in the grounds of the crystal palace at sydenham london and in central park new york those in london still exist so far as the writer is aware but the stern mandate of a former mayor of new york ordered the destruction of the central park models not indeed as incorrect scientifically but as inconsistent with the doctrines of revealed religion and they were accordingly broken up and thrown into the waters of the park lake small replicas of these early attempts at restoring dinosaurs may still be seen in some of the older museums in this country and abroad the real construction of the iguanodon was gradually built up by later discoveries and in eighteen seventy seven an extraordinary find in a coal mine at bernissart in belgium brought to light no less than seventeen skeletons more or less complete these were found in an ancient fissure filled with rocks of comanchic age traversing the carboniferous strata in which the coal seam lay and with them were skeletons of other extinct reptiles of smaller size the open fissure had evidently served as a trap into which these ancient giants had fallen and either killed by the fall or unable to escape from the pit their remains had been subsequently covered up by sediments and the pit filled in to remain sealed up until the present day these skeletons unique in their occurrence and manner of discovery are the pride of the brussels museum of natural history and together with the earlier discoveries have made the iguanodon the most familiar type of dinosaur to the people of england and western europe camptosaurus the american counterpart of the iguanodons of europe was the camptosaurus nearly related and generally similar in proportions but including mostly smaller species and lacking some of the peculiar features of the old world genus in the national museum at washington are mounted two skeletons of camptosaurus a large and a small species and in the american museum a skeleton of a small species it suggests a large kangaroo in size and proportions but the three-toed feet with hoof-like claws the reptilian skull loosely put together with lizard-like cheek teeth and turtle beak indicate a near relative of the great iguanodon Thesalosaurus. 
the iguanodont family survived until the close of the age of reptiles with no great change in proportions or characters its latest member is thesalosaurus a contemporary of triceratops partial skeletons of this animal are shown in the dinosaur hall a more complete one is in the national museum End of chapter 6、Chapter 7 of Dinosaurs, with special reference to the American Museum Collections, by William Diller Matthew. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Jeffrey Smith, New Orleans, Louisiana. Chapter 7 The Beaked Dinosaurs Continued B. The Duckbilled Dinosaurs Trachodon, Sirolophus, etc. Suborder Ornithopoda Family Trachodontidae these animals of the upper cretaceous are probably descended from the iguanodonts of an older period but the long ages that intervened some millions of years have brought about various changes in the race not so much in general proportions as in altering the form and relations of various bones of skull and skeleton and perfecting their adaptation to a somewhat different habit of life so that they must be regarded as descendants perhaps but certainly rather distant relatives of the older group we know more about the trachodonts than any other dinosaurs for not only are the skeletons more frequently found articulated but parts of the skin are not uncommonly preserved with them and in one specimen at least so much of the skin is preserved that it may fairly be called a dinosaur mummy this specimen of trachodon is in the american museum and beside it are two fine mounted skeletons of the largest size there is also on exhibition a panel mount of a nearly related genus sarolophus the skeleton lying as it was found in the rock and a fine skeleton of a third genus corythosaurus with the skin partly preserved on both sides of the crushed and flattened body stands beside it in the tyrannosaurus group when completed will appear a fourth skeleton of the trachodon several skulls and incomplete skeletons on exhibition and other skeletons not yet prepared add to the museum collection of this group trachodon skeletons may also be found in the museums of new haven washington frankfurt on the main london and paris but nowhere a series comparable to that displayed at the american museum the trachodon group the following description of the trachodon group is by mr barnum brown and first appeared in the american museum journal for april 1908 this group takes us back in imagination to the cretaceous period more than three millions of years ago when trachodonts were among the most numerous of the dinosaurs two members of the family are represented here as feeding in the marshes that characterized the period when one is startled by the approach of a carnivorous dinosaur tyrannosaurus their enemy and rises on tiptoe to look over the surrounding plants and determine the direction from which it is coming the other trachodon unaware of danger 
continues peacefully to crop the foliage. Perhaps the erect member of the group had already had unpleasant experiences with hostile beasts, for a bone of its left foot bears three sharp gashes which were made by the teeth of some carnivorous dinosaur. By thus grouping the skeletons in lifelike attitudes, the relation of the different bones can best be shown, but these, of course, are only two of the attitudes commonly taken by the creatures during life. Mechanical and anatomical considerations, especially the long straight shafts of the leg bones, indicate that dinosaurs walked with their limbs straight under the body, rather than in a crawling attitude with the belly close to the ground, as is common among living reptiles. Trachodonts lived near the close of the age of reptiles in the upper Cretaceous, and had a wide geographical distribution, their remains having been found in New Jersey, Mississippi, and Alabama, but more commonly in Wyoming, Montana, and the Dakotas. A suggestion of the great antiquity of these specimens is given by the fact that, since the animals died, layers of rock aggregating many thousand feet in vertical thickness have been deposited along the Atlantic coast. The bones of the erect specimen are but little crushed, and a clear conception of the proportions of the animal can best be obtained from this specimen. It will be seen that the trachodon was shaped somewhat like a kangaroo, with short forelegs, long hind legs, and a long tail. The forelimbs are reduced, indeed, to about one-sixth the size of the hind limbs, and judging from the size and shape of the foot bones, the front legs could not have borne much weight. They were probably used in supporting the anterior portion of the body when the creature was feeding, and in aiding it to recover an upright position. The specimen represented as feeding is posed so that the forelegs carry very little of the weight of the body. There are four toes on the front foot, but the thumb is greatly reduced, and the fifth digit, or little finger, is absent. Subsequent discoveries have shown that the arrangement of the digits made by Marsh and followed in this skeleton is incorrect. It is the first digit that is absent, and the fifth is reduced. The hind legs are massive and have three well-developed toes ending in broad hoofs. The pelvis is lightly constructed with bones elongated like those of birds. The long, deep, compressed tail was particularly adapted for locomotion in the water. It may also have served to balance the creature when standing erect on shore. The broad, expanded lip of bone, known as the fourth trochanter, on the inner posterior face of the femur, or thigh bone, was for the attachment of powerful tail muscles similar to those which enable the crocodile to move its tail from side to side with such dexterity. This trochanter is absent from the thigh bones of land-inhabiting dinosaurs with short tails, such as Stegosaurus and Triceratops. The tail muscles were attached to the vertebrae by numerous rod-like tendons, which are preserved in position as fossils on the erect skeleton. Trachodonts are thought to have been expert swimmers. Unlike other dinosaurs, their remains are frequently found in rocks that were formed under seawater, probably bordering the shores 
but nevertheless containing typical seashells. The elaborate dental apparatus is such as to show clearly that trachodonts were strictly herbivorous creatures. The mouth was expanded to form a broad, duck-like bill, which, during life, was covered with a horny sheath, as in birds and turtles. Each jaw is provided with from 45 to 60 vertical and from 10 to 14 horizontal rows of teeth so that there were more than 2,000 teeth altogether in both jaws. Among living saurians, or reptiles, the small South American iguana, Amblyrhynchus, may be compared in some respects with the trachodons, notwithstanding the difference in size. These modern saurians live in great numbers on the shores of the Galapagos Islands off the coast of Chile. They swim out to sea in shoals and feed exclusively on seaweed, which grows on the bottom at some distance from shore. The animal swims with perfect ease and quickness, by a serpentine movement of its body and flattened tail, its legs meanwhile being closely pressed to its side and motionless. This is also the method of propulsion of crocodiles when swimming. The carnivorous or flesh-eating dinosaurs that lived on land, such as Allosaurus and Tyrannosaurus, were protected from foes by their sharp biting teeth, while the land-living herbivorous forms were provided with defensive horns, as in Triceratops, sharp spines, as in Stegosaurus, or were completely armored, as in Ankylosaurus. Trachodon was not provided with horns, spines, or plated armor, but it was sufficiently protected from carnivorous landforms by being able to enter and remain in the water. Its skin was covered with small raised scales, pentagonal in form on the body and tail, where they were largest, with smaller reticulations over the joints, but never overlapping, as in snakes or fishes. A trachodon skeleton was recently found with an impression of the skin surrounding the vertebrae, which is so well preserved that it gives even the contour of the tail, as is shown in the illustration. During the existence of the trachodonts, the climate of the northern part of North America was much warmer than it is at present. The plant remains indicating a climate for Wyoming and Montana, similar to what now prevails in Southern California. Palm leaves resembling the palmetto of Florida are frequently found in the same rocks with these skeletons. Here occur also such, at present, widely separated trees as the ginkgo, now native of China, and the sequoia, now native of the Pacific coast. Fruits and leaves of the fig tree are also common, but most abundant among the plant remains are the equisiti, or horsetail rushes, some species of which possibly supplied the trachodons with food. Impressions of the more common plants found in the rocks of this period, with sections of the tree trunks showing the woody structure, will be or have been introduced into the group as the ground on which the skeletons stand. In the rivers and bayous of that remote period, there also lived many kinds of unios, or freshwater clams, and other shells, the casts of which are frequently found with trachodon bones. The fossil trunk of a coniferous tree was found in Wyoming, 
which was filled with groups of wood-living shells similar to living teredo these also will be introduced in the groundwork the skeleton mounted in a feeding posture was one of the principal specimens in the cope collection which through the generosity of the late president jessop was purchased and given to the american museum it was found near the moro river north of the black hills south dakota in 1882 by dr j l wortman and mr r s hill collectors for professor cope the erect skeleton came from crooked creek central montana and was found by a ranchman mr oscar hunter while riding through the badlands with a companion in 1904 the specimen was partly exposed with backbone and ribs united in position the parts that were weathered out are much lighter in color than the other bones their large size caused some discussion between the ranchmen and to settle the question mr hunter dismounted and kicked off all the tops of the vertebrae and rib heads above ground thereby proving by their brittle nature that they were stone and not buffalo bones as the other man contended the proof was certainly conclusive but it was extremely exasperating to the subsequent collectors another ranchman mr alfred sensiba heard of the find and knowing that it was valuable traded mr hunter a six-shooter for his interest in it the specimen was purchased from messrs sensiba brothers and excavated by the american museum in 1906 the dinosaur mummy we all believe that the dinosaurs existed but to realize it is not so easy even with the help of the mounted skeletons and restorations they are somewhat unreal and shadowy beings in the minds of most of us but this dinosaur mummy sprawling on his back and covered with shrunken skin a real specimen not restored in any part brings home the reality of this ancient world even as the mummy of an ancient egyptian brings home to us the reality of the world of the pharaohs the description of this unique skeleton by professor henry fairfield osborne first appeared in the museum journal for january 1911 two years ago 1908 through the jessop fund the museum came into possession of a most unique specimen discovered in august 1908 by the veteran fossil hunter charles h sternberg of kansas it is a large herbivorous dinosaur of the closing period of the age of reptiles and is known to paleontologists as trachodon or more popularly as the duck-billed dinosaur the skeleton or hard parts of these very remarkable animals had been known for over 40 years and a few specimens of the epidermal covering but it was not until the discovery of the sternberg specimen that a complete knowledge of the outer covering of these dinosaurs was gained it appears probable that in a number of cases these priceless skin impressions were mostly destroyed in removing the fossil specimens from their surroundings because the explorers were not expecting to find anything of the kind altogether seven specimens have been discovered in which these delicate skin impressions were partly preserved but the trachodon mummy far surpasses all the others as it yields a nearly complete picture of the outer covering 
The reason the Sternberg specimen, Trachodon anectens, may be known as a dinosaur mummy is that in all parts of the animal which are preserved, that is, all except the hind limbs and the tail, the epidermis is shrunken around the limbs, tightly drawn along the bony surfaces, and contracted like a great curtain below the chest area. This condition of the epidermis suggests the following theory of the deposition and preservation of this wonderful specimen, namely, that after dying a natural death, the animal was not attacked or preyed upon by its enemies, and the body lay exposed to the sun entirely undisturbed for a long time, perhaps upon a broad sand flat of a stream in the low water stage. The muscles and viscera thus became completely dehydrated or desiccated by the action of the sun. The epidermis shrank around the limbs was tightly drawn down along all the bony surfaces and became hardened and leathery. On the abdominal surfaces, the epidermis was certainly drawn within the body cavity, while it was thrown into creases and folds along the sides of the body, owing to the shrinkage of the tissues within. At the termination of a possible low water season, during which these processes of desiccation took place, the mummy may have been caught in a sudden flood, carried down the stream, and rapidly buried in a bed of fine river sand intermingled with sufficient elements of clay to take a perfect cast or mold of all the epidermal markings before any of the epidermal tissues had time to soften under the solvent action of the water. In this way the markings were indicated with absolute distinctness. The visitor will be able, by the use of the hand glass, to study even the finer details of the pattern, although, of course, there is no trace either of the epidermis itself, which has entirely disappeared, or of the pigmentation or coloring, if such existed. Although attaining a height of 15 to 16 feet, the trachodons were not covered with scales or a bony protecting armature, but with dermal tubercles of relatively small size, which varied in shape and arrangement in different species, and not improbably associated with this varied epidermal pattern, there was a varied color pattern. The theory of a color pattern is based chiefly upon the fact that the larger tubercles concentrate and become more numerous on all those portions of the body exposed to the sun, that is, on the outer surfaces of the fore and hind limbs, and appear to increase also along the sides of the body, and to be more concentrated on the back. On the less exposed areas, the underside of the body and the inner sides of the limbs, the smaller tubercles are more numerous, the larger tubercles being reduced to small, irregularly arranged patches. From analogy with existing lizards and snakes, we may suppose, therefore, that the trachodons presented a darker appearance when seen from the back, and a lighter appearance when seen from the front. The thin character of the epidermis, as revealed by this specimen, favors also the theory that these animals spent a large part of their time in the water, which theory is strengthened by the fact that the diminutive forelimb terminates not in claws or hoofs, but in a broad extension of the skin, reaching beyond the fingers and forming a kind of paddle. Footnote. There is some doubt whether this was really the condition during life. W. D. M. End of footnote. The marginal web which connects all the fingers with each other, 
together with the fact that the lower side of the forelimb is as delicate in its epidermal structure as the upper certainly tends to support the theory of the swimming rather than the walking or terrestrial function of this fore paddle as indicated in the accompanying preliminary restoration that was made by charles r knight working under the writer's direction one is drawn in the conventional bipedal or standing posture while the other is in a quadrupedal pose or walking position sustaining or balancing the fore part of the body on a muddy surface with its four feet in the distant water a large number of animals are disporting themselves the designation of these animals as the duck-billed dinosaurs in reference to the broadening of the beak has long been considered in connection with the theory of aquatic habitat the conversion of the forelimb into a sort of paddle as evidenced by the sternberg specimen strengthens this theory this truly wonderful specimen therefore nearly doubles our previous insight into the habits and life of a very remarkable group of reptiles Saurolophus, Corythosaurus. In the latest Cretaceous formation, the lance or Triceratops beds, all the duck-billed dinosaurs are much alike and are referred to the single genus Trachodon. In somewhat older formations of the Cretacic period, there were several different kinds saurolophus has a high bony spine rising from the top of the skull in corythosaurus there is a thin high crest like the crown of a cassowary on top of the skull and the muzzle is short and small giving a very peculiar aspect to the head complete skeletons of these two genera are exhibited in the dinosaur hall the corythosaurus is worthy of careful study as the skin of the body hind limbs and tail the ossified tendons and even the impressions of the muscular tissues in parts of the body and tail are more or less clearly indicated these duck-billed dinosaurs probably ranged all over north america and the northerly portions of the old world during the later cretacic fragmentary remains have been found in new jersey and southward along the atlantic coast a partial skeleton was described many years ago by lydy under the name of hadrosaurus and restored and mounted in the museum of the philadelphia academy of sciences telmatosaurus of the gossau formation in austria also belongs to this group and fragmentary remains have been found in the upper cretacic of belgium england and france end of chapter seven chapter eight of dinosaurs with special reference to the american museum collections by william diller matthew this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by jeffrey smith new orleans louisiana chapter eight the beaked dinosaurs continued c the armored dinosaurs stegosaurus and chylosaurus suborder stegosauria this group of dinosaurs is most remarkable for the massive bony armor plates crests or spines covering the body and tail they were more or less completely quadrupedal instead of bipedal with straight post-like limbs and short rounded hoofed feet adapted to support the weight of the massive body and heavy armature 
although so different superficially from the bird-footed biped iguanodonts they are evidently related to them for the teeth are similar and the horny beak the construction of the pelvis the three-toed hind foot and four-toed front foot all betray relationship from what we know of them it seems probable that they evolved from iguanodont ancestors developing the bony armor as a protection against the attacks of carnivorous dinosaurs and modifying the proportions of limbs and feet to enable them to support its weight they were evidently herbivorous and some of them of gigantic size smaller kinds with less massive armor have been found in europe but the largest and most extraordinary members of this strange race are from north america stegosaurus this extraordinary reptile equaled the allosaurus in size and bore along the crest of the back a double row of enormous bony plates projecting upward and somewhat outward alternately to one side and the other the largest of these plates situated just back of the pelvis were over two feet high two and a half long thinning out from a base four inches thick the tail was armed with four or more stout spines two feet long and five or six inches thick at the base in the neck region and probably elsewhere the skin had numerous small bony nodules and some larger ones embedded in its substance or protecting its surface the head was absurdly small for so huge an animal and the stiff thick tail projected backward but was not long enough to reach the ground the hind limbs are very long and straight the forelimbs relatively short and the short high arched back and extremely deep and compressed body served to exaggerate the height and prominence of the great plates the surface of these plates covered with a network of blood vessels shows that they bore a covering of thick horny skin during life which probably projected as a ridge beyond their edges and still further increased their size the spines of the tail also were probably cased in horn this extraordinary animal was a contemporary of the brontosaurus and allosaurus and its discovery was one of the great achievements of the late professor marsh the skeletons which he described are mounted in the yale and national museums another skeleton was found in the famous bone cabin quarry near medicine bow wyoming by the american museum expedition of 1901 this skeleton at present withdrawn from lack of space will be mounted in the jurassic dinosaur hall in the new wing now under construction ankylosaurus related to stegosaurus equally huge but very different in proportions and character of its armor was the ankylosaurus of the late cretacic this animal a contemporary of the tyrannosaurus and duck-billed dinosaurs was more effectively though less grotesquely armored than its more ancient relative the body is covered with massive bony plates set close together and lying flat over the surface from head to tip of tail while the stegosaur's body was narrow and compressed in this animal it is exceptionally broad and the wide-spreading ribs are coossified with the vertebrae making a very solid support for the transverse rows of armor plates 
the head is broad triangular flat topped and solidly armored the plates consolidated with the surface of the skull and overhanging sides in front the nostrils and eyes overhung by plates and bosses of bone and the tail ended in a blunt heavy club of massive plates consolidated to each other and to the tip of the tail vertebrae the legs were short massive and straight ending probably in elephant-like feet the animal has well been called the most ponderous animated citadel the world has ever seen and we may suppose that when it tucked in its legs and settled down on the surface it would be proof even against the attacks of the terrible tyrannosaur this marvelous animal was made known to science by the discoveries of the museum parties in montana and alberta under barnum brown fragmentary remains of smaller relatives had been discovered by earlier explorers but nothing that gave any adequate notion of its character or gigantic size from a partial skeleton discovered in the hell creek beds of montana and others in the edmonton and belly river formations of the red deer river alberta it has been possible to reconstruct the entire skeleton of the animal save for the feet and to locate and arrange most of the armor plates exactly a skeleton mount from these specimens will shortly be constructed for the cretaceous dinosaur hall skeletosaurus polacanthus etc various armed dinosaurs of smaller size and less heavily plated have been described from the jurassic comanchic and cretacic formations of europe the best known are Skeletosaurus of the Lower Jurassic of England and Polacanthus of the Comanchic, Weldon. Stegopelta of the Cretaceous of Wyoming is more nearly related to Ankylosaurus. End of chapter 8chapter nine of dinosaurs with special reference to the american museum collections by william diller matthew this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by jeffrey smith new orleans louisiana chapter nine the beaked dinosaurs concluded d the horned dinosaurs triceratops etc suborder ceratopsia in 1887 professor marsh published a brief notice of what he supposed to be a fossil bison horn found near denver colorado two years later the explorations of the lamented john b hatcher in wyoming and montana resulted in the unexpected discovery that this horn belonged not to a bison but to a gigantic horned reptile and that it belonged not in the geological yesterday as at first thought but in the far back cretacic millions of years ago for mr hatcher found complete skulls and later secured skeletons clearly of the dinosaurian group but representing a race of dinosaurs whose existence or at least their extraordinary character had been quite unsuspected it appeared indeed that certain teeth and skeleton bones previously discovered by professor cope were related to this new type of dinosaur but the fragments known to the philadelphia professor gave him no idea of what the animal was like although with his usual acumen 
he had discerned that they differed from any animal known to science and registered them as new under the names of agathaumus 1873 and monoclonius 1876 professor marsh renamed his supposed bison ceratops that is horned face and gave to the closely related skulls discovered by mr hatcher the name of triceratops that is three-horned face while to the whole group he gave the name of ceratopsia these were the first of a long series of discoveries which through scientific and popular descriptions have made the horned dinosaurs familiar to the world most of them are still very imperfectly known and of their evolution and earlier history we know very little as yet but we can form a fairly correct idea of their general appearance and habits and of the part they played in the world of the late cretacic so far as known they were limited to north america the most striking feature of the horned dinosaurs is the gigantic skull armed with a pair of horns over the orbits and a median horn on the nasal bones in front and with a great bony crest projecting at the back and sides in some species the skull with its bony frill attains a length of seven or even eight feet and about three feet width the usual length is five or six feet and the width about three in the best known genus triceratops the paired horns are long and stout and the front horn quite short or almost absent while in monoclonius these proportions are reversed the front horn being long while the paired horns are rudimentary the teeth are in a single row but are broadened out into a wide grinding surface the animal was quadrupedal with short massive limbs and rounded elephantine feet tipped with hoofs three in the hind foot four in the forefoot a short massive tail that could hardly reach the ground a short broad-barreled body and a short neck completely hidden on top and sides by the overhanging bony frill of the skull in many respects these animals are suggestive far more than any other dinosaurs of the great quadrupeds of tertiary and modern times rhinoceroses hippopotami titanotheres and elephants as in the horns they suggest the bison for this reason although less gigantic than the brontosaurus or tyrannosaurus less grotesque perhaps than the stegosaurus they are more interesting than any other dinosaurs while thus departing far from the earlier type of the beaked dinosaurs the iguanodonts they are evidently descended from them triceratops this is the best known of the horned dinosaurs as various skulls and partial skeletons have been found from which it has been possible to reconstruct the entire animal there is a mounted skeleton in the national museum another will shortly be mounted in the american museum and there are skulls in several american and european museums triceratops exceeded the largest rhinoceroses in bulk equaling a fairly large elephant but with much shorter legs the great horns over the eyes projected forward or partly upward in one of our skulls they are thirty three and a half inches long during life they were probably covered with horn increasing the length by six inches or perhaps a foot 
the ball-like condyle for articulation of the neck lies far underneath at the base of the frill almost in the middle of the skull monoclonius ceratops etc the triceratops and another equally gigantic horned dinosaur tarosaurus were the last survivors of their race in somewhat older formations of cretacic age are found remains of smaller kinds some of them ancestors of these latest survivors others collaterally related none of these have the bony frill completely roofing over the neck as it does in triceratops there is always a central spine projecting backwards and widening out at the top to the bony margin of the frill which sweeps around on each side to join bony plates that project from the sides of the skull top this encloses an open space or fenestra so that the neck was not completely protected above sometimes the margin of the frill is plain at other times it carries a number of great spikes like a gigantic horned lizard phrynosoma in ceratops the horns over the eyes are large and the nasal horn small in monoclonius the nasal horn is large and those over the eyes are rudimentary the great variety of species that has been found in recent years shows that these horned dinosaurs were a numerous and varied race of which as yet we know only a few of their evolution we have little direct knowledge but probably they are descended from the iguanodonts and camptosaurs of the comanchic and their quadrupedal gait huge heads short tails and other peculiarities are secondary specializations their ancestors being bipedal long-tailed small-headed and hornless the fine skulls of triceratops monoclonius ceratops an anchiceratops in the museum collections illustrate the variety of these remarkable animals complete skeletons of the first two genera are being prepared for mounting and exhibition end of chapter nine Chapter 10 of Dinosaurs, with special reference to the American Museum Collections, by William Diller Matthew. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Jeffrey Smith, New Orleans, Louisiana. Chapter 10. Geographical Distribution of Dinosaurs remains of dinosaurs have been found in all the continents but chiefly in europe and north america explorations in other parts of the world have not as yet been sufficient to show whether or not each continent developed a special kinds peculiar to it nor to afford any reliable evidence as to whether the relations of the continents were different during the mesozoic thus far the carnivorous group seems most widespread for it alone has been found in australia the sauropods or amphibious dinosaurs have been found in europe north america india madagascar patagonia and africa sufficient to show that their distribution was worldwide with the possible exception of australia and probable exception of most oceanic islands few of the modern oceanic islands existed at that time although there may well have been many others no longer extant 
the beaked dinosaurs are more limited in their distribution for none of them so far as at present known reached australia or south america but in the present stage of discovery it would be rash to conclude that they were surely limited to the regions where they have been discovered it is not wholly clear as yet whether the dinosaurian fauna that flourished at the end of the jurassic in the north survived to the upper cretacic in the southern continents but present evidence points that way and indicates that the girdle of ocean which during the cretacic depression encircled the northern world formed a barrier which the cretacic dinosaurian fauna never succeeded in crossing the earlier groups of beaked dinosaurs are found in both europe and america and in the cretacic the duck-billed and armored groups are represented in both regions the horned dinosaurs however are known with certainty only from north america while most of the important fossil specimens in this country have been found in the west more fragmentary remains have been found on the atlantic seaboard and it is probable that they ranged all over the intervening region wherever they found an environment suited to their particular needs end of chapter ten Chapter 11 of Dinosaurs, with special reference to the American Museum Collections by William Diller Matthew. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Jeffrey Smith, New Orleans, Louisiana. Chapter 11, Part 1. Collecting Dinosaurs how and where they are found the visitor who is introduced to the dinosaurs through the medium of books and pictures or of the skeletons exhibited in the great museums finds it hard well nigh impossible to realize their existence however willing he may be to accept on faith the reconstructions of the skeletons, the restorations of the animals, and their supposed environment, it yet remains to him somewhat of a fairy tale, a fanciful, imaginative world peopled with ogres and dragons, and belonging to the unreal, once upon a time, which has no connection with the ever-present workaday world in which we live birds and squirrels rabbits and foxes belong to this real world because he has seen them in his walks through the woods even elephants and rhinoceroses though his acquaintance be limited to menagerie specimens seem fairly real although one recalls the farmer's comment on first seeing a giraffe in the zoological park there ain't no sich animal. But dinosaurs? One easily realizes the state of mind that prompts the inquiry so often made by visitors to the dinosaur hall. They make these out of plaster, don't they? So far as is consistent with good taste, the aim of the American Museum has been to enable the visitor to see for himself how much of plaster reconstruction there is to each skeleton and to explain in the labels what the basis was for the reconstructed parts how they are found but to the collector these extinct animals are real enough as he journeys over the western plains he sees the various living inhabitants thereof birds and beasts, as well as men pursuing their various modes of life. 
here and there he comes across the scattered skeletons or bones of modern animals lying strewn upon the surface of the ground or half buried in the soil of a cut bank in the shales or sandstones that underlie the soil he finds the objects of his search skeletons or bones of extinct animals similarly disposed but buried in rock instead of soft soil and exposed in canyons and gullies cut through the solid rock each rock formation he knows by precept and experience carries its own peculiar fauna its animals are different from those of the formation above and from those in the formation below days and weeks he may spend in fruitless search following along the outcrop of the formation through rugged badlands along steep canyon walls around isolated points or buttes without finding more than a few fragments but spurred on by vivid interest and the rainbow prospect of some new or rare find finally perhaps after innumerable disappointments a trail of fragments leads up to a really promising prospect a cautious investigation indicates that an articulated skeleton is buried at this point and that not too much of it has gone out and rolled in weathered fragments down the slope for the tedious and delicate process of disinterring the skeleton from the rock he will need to keep ever in mind the form and relations of each bone the picture of the skeleton as it may have been when buried the heavy ledges above are removed with pick and shovel often with help of dynamite and a team and scraper as he gets nearer to the stratum in which the bones lie the work must be more and more careful a false blow with pick or chisel might destroy irreparably some important bony structure bit by bit he traces out the position and lay of the bones working now mostly with awl and whisk broom uncovering the more massive portions blocking out the delicate bones in the rock soaking the exposed surfaces repeatedly with thin gum mucilage or shellac channeling around and between the bones until they stand out on little pedestals above the quarry floor then after the gum or shellac has dried thoroughly and hardened the soft parts and the surfaces of bone exposed are further protected by pasting on a layer of tissue paper it is ready for the plaster jacket this consists of strips of burlap dipped in plaster of paris and pasted over the surface of each block until top and sides all but the pedestal on which it rests are completely cased in the strips being pressed and kneaded close to the surface of the block as they are laid on when this jacket sets and dries the block is rigid and stiff enough to lift and turn over the remains of the pedestal are trimmed off and the under surface is plastered like the rest with large blocks it is often necessary to paste into the jacket on upper or both sides boards scantling or sticks of wood to secure additional rigidity for should the block rack or become shattered inside even though no fragments were lost the specimen would be more or less completely ruined the next stage will be packing in boxes with straw hay or other materials hauling to the railway and shipment to new york arrived at the museum the boxes are unpacked each block laid out on a table 
the upper side of its plaster jacket softened with water and cut away and the preparation of the bone begins always it is more or less cracked and broken up but the fragments lie in their natural relations each piece must be lifted out thoroughly clean from rock and dirt and the fractured surfaces cemented together again parts of bones especially the interior are often rotted into dust while the harder outer surface is still preserved the dust must be scraped out the interior filled with a plaster cement and the surface pieces reset in position very often a steel rod is set into the plaster filling the interior of a bone to secure additional strength after this preparation is completed each part being soaked repeatedly with shellac until it will absorb no more the bones can be handled and laid out for study or exhibition then if they are to be mounted for a fossil skeleton comes the work of restoring the missing parts for this a plaster composition is used where only parts of one side are missing the corresponding parts of the other side are used for model where both sides are missing other individuals or nearly related species may serve as a guide but it is seldom wise to attempt restoration of a skeleton unless at least two-thirds of it is present composite skeletons made up of the remains of several or many individuals have been attempted but they are dangerous experiments in animals so imperfectly known as are most of the dinosaurs there is too much risk of including bones that pertain to other species or genera and of introducing thereby into the restoration a more or less erroneous concept of the animal which it represents the same criticism applies to an overly large amount of plaster restoration in some instances the missing parts of a skeleton are not restored because even though but a small part be gone we have no good evidence to guide in its reconstruction this gives an imperfect and sometimes misleading concept of what the whole skeleton was like but it is better than restoring it erroneously usually with the more imperfect skeletons a skull a limb or some other characteristic parts may be placed on exhibition but the remainder of the specimen is stored in the study collections where they are found the chief dinosaur localities in this country are along the flanks of the rocky mountains and the plains to the eastward from canada to texas not that dinosaurs were any more abundant there than elsewhere they probably ranged all over north america and different kinds inhabited other continents as well but in the east and the middle west the conditions were not favorable for preserving their remains except in a few localities formations of this age are less extensive especially those of the delta and coast swamps which the dinosaurs frequented and where they do occur they are largely covered by vegetation and cannot be explored to advantage in the arid western regions these formations girdle the rockies and outlying mountain chains for two thousand miles from north to south and are extensively exposed in great escarpments river canyons and badland areas bare of soil and vegetation and affording an immense stretch of exposed rock for the explorer much of this area indeed is desert 
too far away from water to be profitably searched under present conditions or too far away from railroads to allow of transportation of the fines at a reasonable expense fossils are much more common in certain parts of the region and these localities have mostly been explored more or less thoroughly but the field is far from being exhausted new localities have been found and old localities re-explored in recent years yielding specimens equal to or better than any heretofore discovered and as the railroad and the automobile render new regions accessible and the erosion of the formations by wind and rain brings new specimens to the surface we may look forward to new discoveries for many years to come in other continents except in europe there has been but little exploration for dinosaurs enough is known to assure us that they will yield fauny no less extensive and remarkable than our own we are in fact only beginning to appreciate the vast extent and variety of these records of a past world in a preceding chapter it was shown that the chief formations in which dinosaur remains have been found belong to the end of the Jurassic and the end of the Cretacic periods. The Jurassic dinosaur formations skirt the Rockies and outlying mountain ranges, but are often turned up on edge and poorly exposed, or barren of fossils. The richest collecting ground is in the Laramie Plains, between the Rockies and the Laramie Range, in south central wyoming but important finds have also been made in colorado and utah the cretaceous dinosaur formations extend somewhat further out on the plains to the eastward and the best collecting regions thus far explored are in eastern wyoming central montana and in alberta canada the first discovery of dinosaurs in the west by professor s w williston most great discoveries are due rather to a state of mind if i may use such an expression than to accident the discovery of the immense dinosaur deposits in the rocky mountains in march eighteen seventy seven may truthfully be called great for nothing in paleontology has equaled it and that it was made by three observers simultaneously cannot be called purely an accident these discoverers were mr o lucas then a school teacher later clergyman professor arthur lakes then a teacher in the school of mines at golden colorado and Mr. William Reed, then a section foreman of the Union Pacific Railroad at Como, Wyoming, later the curator of paleontology of the University of Wyoming, even as I write this comes the notice of his death, the last. I knew them all, and the last two were long, intimate friends. In the autumn of 1878, I wrote the following quote, The history of their discovery, the dinosaurs, is both interesting and remarkable. For years, the beds containing them had been studied by geologists of experience under the surveys of Hayden and King, but with the possible exception of the half of a caudal vertebra obtained by Hayden and described by Lydie as a species of poikilopleuron, not a single fragment had been recognized. This is all the more remarkable from the fact that in several of the localities, 
i have observed acres literally strewn with fragments of bones many of them extremely characteristic and so large as to have taxed the strength of a strong man to lift them three of the localities known to me are in the immediate vicinity if not upon the actual town sites of thriving villages and for years numerous fragments have been collected by or for tourists and exhibited as fossil wood the quantities hitherto obtained though apparently so vast are wholly unimportant in comparison with those awaiting the researches of geologists throughout the rocky mountain region i doubt not that many hundreds of tons will eventually be exhumed End quote. rather a startling prophecy to make within eighteen months of their discovery but it was hardly exaggerated it is impossible to say which of these three observers actually made the first discovery of Jurassic dinosaurs. Whatever doubt there is, is in favor of Mr. Reed. Professor Lakes, accompanied by his friend Mr. E. L. Beckwith, an engineer, was one day in March 1877 hunting along the hogback in the vicinity of Morrison, Colorado, for fossil leaves in the Dakota Cretaceous sandstone, which caps the ridge, when he saw a large block of sandstone with an enormous vertebra partly embedded in it. He discussed the nature of the fossil with his friend, so he told me, and finally concluded that it was a fossil bone. He had recently come from England and had heard of Professor Phillips' discoveries of similar dinosaurs there. He knew of Professor Marsh of Yale from his recent discoveries of toothed birds in the chalk of Kansas and reported the find to him as a result the specimen rock and all was shipped to him by express at ten cents a pound and professor marsh immediately announced the discovery of titanosaurus atlantosaurus imanus a huge dinosaur having a probable length of one hundred and fifteen feet and unknown height and professor lakes was immediately set at work in the morrison quarry nearby whence comes the accepted name of these dinosaur beds in the rocky mountains professor lakes once showed me the exact spot where he found his first specimen mr lucas teaching his first term of a country school that spring in Garden Park near Canyon City, as an amateur botanist was interested in the plants of the vicinity. Rambling through the adjacent hills in search of them, in March 1877, he stumbled upon some fragments of fossil bones in a little ravine not far from the famous quarry, later worked for professor marsh he recognized them as fossils and they greatly excited not only his curiosity but the curiosity of the neighbors he had heard of the late professor cope and sent some of the bones to him who promptly labeled them camarasaurus supremus the announcement of these discoveries promptly brought Mr. David Baldwin, Professor Marsh's collector in New Mexico, to the scene. Only a few months previously, he had discovered fossil bones in the red beds of New Mexico, the since famous Permian deposits. He naturally explored the same beds at Canyon City, immediately below the dinosaur deposits, and soon found the still very problematical halopus skeleton at their very top, a specimen which, after nearly forty years, 
remains unique of its kind. A few years earlier, Professor Marsh, on his way east from the tertiary deposits of western Wyoming, had stopped at Como, Wyoming, to observe the strange salamanders, or fish with legs, as they were widely known, so abundant in the lake at that place, about whose transformations he later wrote a paper, perhaps the only one on modern vertebrates that he ever published. While he was there, Mr. Carlin, the station agent, showed him some fossil bone fragments, so Mr. Reed told me that they had picked up in the vicinity and about which Professor Marsh made some comments. But he was so engrossed with the other discoveries he was then making that he did not follow up the suggestion. Had he done so, the discovery of the Jurassic dinosaurs would have been made five years earlier. Mr. Reed, tramping over the famous Como Hills after game, he had been a professional hunter of game for the construction camps of the Union Pacific Railroad, in the winter and spring of 1877, observed some fossil bones just south of the railway station that excited his curiosity. But he and Mr. Carlin did not make their discovery known to Professor Marsh till the following autumn, and then, under assumed names, fearing that they would be robbed of their discovery. I was sent to Como in November of 1877 from Canyon City. I got off the train at the station after midnight and inquired for the nearest hotel the station comprised two houses only, and where I could find Messrs. Smith and Robinson. I was told that the section house was the only hotel in the place, and that these gentlemen lived in the country, and that there was no regular bus line yet running to their ranch. A freshly opened box of cigars, however, helped clear up things and I joined Mr. Reed the next day in opening quarry number one of the Como Hills. Inasmuch as the mercury in the thermometer during the next two months seldom reached zero, upward I mean, the opening of this famous deposit was made under difficulties. That so much head cheese, as we called it, was shipped to Professor Marsh was more the fault of the weather and his importunities than our carelessness. However, we found some of the types of dinosaurs that have since become famous. I joined Professor Lakes at the Morrison Quarry in early September of 1877 and helped dig out some of the bones of Atlantosaurus. A few weeks later, I was sent to Canyon City to help Professor Mudge, my old teacher, and Mr. Felch, who had begun work there in the famous Marsh Quarry. It was here that we found the type of Diplodocus. The hind leg, pelvis, and much of the tail of this specimen lay in very orderly arrangement in the sandstone near the edge of the quarry but the bones were broken into innumerable pieces. After consultation, we decided that they were too much broken to be worth saving, and so most of them went over into the dump. Sacrilege, doubtless the modern collector will say, but we did not know much about the modern methods of collecting in those days, and moreover, we were in too much of a hurry to get the new discoveries to Yale College to take much pains with them. I did observe that the caudal vertebrae had very peculiar chevrons, unlike others that I had seen, and so I attempted to save some samples of them by pasting them up with thick layers of paper. 
had we only known of plaster of paris and burlap the whole specimen might easily have been saved later when i reached new haven i took off the paper and called professor marsh's attention to the strange chevrons and diplodocus was the result my own connection with the discoveries of these old dinosaurs continued only through the following summer in wyoming when we added the first mammals from the hills immediately back of the station and the types of some of the smaller dinosaurs and when we explored the vicinity for other deposits on rock creek and in the freeze out mountains how many tons of these fossils have since been dug up from these deposits in the rocky mountains is beyond computation my prophecy of hundreds of tons has been fulfilled and they are preserved in many museums of the world s w williston end of chapter 11 part 1chapter eleven of dinosaurs with special reference to the american museum collections by william diller matthew this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by jeffrey smith new orleans louisiana chapter eleven part two the dinosaurs of the bone cabin quarry by henry fairfield osborne one is often asked the questions how do you find fossils how do you know where to look for them one of the charms of the fossil hunter's life is the variety the element of certainty combined with the gambling element of chance like the prospector for gold the fossil hunter may pass suddenly from the extreme of dejection to the extreme of elation luck comes in a variety of ways sometimes as the result of prolonged and deliberate scientific search in a region which is known to be fossiliferous sometimes in such a prosaic manner as the digging of a well among discoveries of a highly suggestive almost romantic kind perhaps none is more remarkable than the one i shall now describe discovery of the great dinosaur quarry in central wyoming at the head of a draw or small valley not far from the medicine bow river lies the ruin of a small and unique building which marks the site of the greatest find of extinct animals made in a single locality in any part of the world the fortunate fossil hunter who stumbled on this site was mr walter granger of the american museum expedition of eighteen ninety seven in the spring of eighteen ninety eight as i approached the hillock on which the ruin stands I observed among the beautiful flowers, the blooming cacti, and the dwarf bushes of the desert what were apparently numbers of dark brown boulders. On closer examination, it proved that there is really not a single rock, hardly even a pebble, on this hillock. All these apparent boulders are ponderous fossils which have slowly accumulated or washed out on the surface from a great dinosaur bed beneath. A Mexican sheep herder had collected some of these petrified bones for the foundations of his cabin, the first ever built of such strange materials the excavation of a promising outcrop was almost immediately rewarded by finding a thigh bone nearly six feet in length which sloped downward into the earth running into the lower leg and finally into the foot with all the respective parts lying in the natural position as in life this proved to be the previously unknown hind limb of the great dinosaur diplodocus 
in this manner the bone cabin quarry was discovered and christened the total contents of the quarry are represented in the diagram it has given us by dint of six successive years of hard work the materials for an almost complete revival of the life of the laramie region as it was in the days of the dinosaurs by the aid of workmen of every degree of skill by grace of the accumulated wisdom of the nineteenth century by the constructive imagination by the aid of the sculptor and the artist we can summon these living forms and the living environment from the vasty deep of the past the famous como bluffs the circumstances leading up to our discovery serve to introduce the story from eighteen ninety to eighteen ninety seven we had been steadily delving into the history of the age of mammals in deposits dating from two hundred thousand to three million years back as we rudely estimate geological time in the course of seven years such substantial progress had been made that i decided to push into the history of the age of reptiles also and following the pioneers marsh and cope to begin exploration in the period which at once marks the dawn of mammalian life and the climax of the evolution of the great amphibious dinosaurs in the spring of eighteen ninety seven we accordingly began exploration in the heart of the laramie plains on the como bluffs on arrival we found numbers of massive bones strewn along the base of these bluffs tumbled from their stratum above too weather-worn to attract collectors and serving only to remind one of the time when these animals the greatest by far that nature has ever produced on land were monarchs of the world aroused from sleep on a clear evening in camp by the heavy rumble of a passing Union Pacific freight train, I shall never forget my meditations on the contrast between the imaginary picture of the great age of dinosaurs, fertile in cycads and in a wonderful variety of reptiles, and the present age of steam, of heavy locomotives toiling through the semi-arid and partly desert Laramie Plains footnote at this time the union pacific railroad directly passed the bluffs in the recent improvement of the grade the main line has been moved to the south hfo end of footnote so many animals had already been removed from these bluffs that we were not very sanguine of finding more but after a fortnight our prospecting was rewarded by finding parts of skeletons of the long-limbed dinosaur diplodocus and of the heavy-limbed dinosaur brontosaurus the whole summer was occupied in taking these animals out for shipment to the east the so-called plaster method of removal being applied with the greatest success briefly this is a surgical device applied on a large scale for the setting of the much fractured bones of a fossilized skeleton it consists in setting great blocks of the skeleton stone and all in a firm capsule of plaster subsequently reinforced by great splints of wood firmly drawn together with wet rawhide the object is to keep all the fragments and splinters of bone together until it can reach the skillful hands of the museum preparator. The Rock Waves Connecting the Bluffs and the Quarry The Como Bluffs are about ten miles south of the Bone Cabin Quarry. Between them is a broad stretch of the Laramie Plains the exposed bone layer in the two localities is of the same age and originally was a continuous level stratum which may be designated as the dinosaur beds 
but this stratum disturbed and crowded by the uplifting of the not far distant laramie range of mountains and the freeze out hills was thrown into a number of great folds or rock waves large portions especially of the upfolds or anticlines of the waves have been subsequently removed by erosion the edges of these upfolds have been exposed thus weathering out their fossilized contents while downfolds are still buried beneath the earth for the explorers of coming centuries therefore as one rides across the country today from the bluffs to the quarry startling the intensely modern fauna the prong-horned antelopes jackrabbits and sage chickens he is passing over a vast graveyard which has been profoundly folded and otherwise shaken up and disturbed sometimes one finds the bone layer removed entirely sometimes horizontal sometimes oblique and again dipping directly into the heart of the earth this layer dinosaur beds is not more than two hundred and seventy four feet in thickness and is altogether of freshwater origin but as a proof of the oscillations of the earth level both before and after this great thin sheet of freshwater rock was so widely spread there are evidences of the previous invasion of the sea ichthyosaur beds and of the subsequent invasion of the sea monosaur beds in the whole rocky mountain region in traveling through the west when once one has grasped the idea of continental oscillation or submergence and emergence of the land of the sequence of the marine and freshwater deposits in laying down these pages of earth history he will know exactly where to look for this wonderful layer bed of the giant dinosaurs he will find that owing to the uplift of various mountain ranges it outcrops along the entire eastern face of the rockies around the black hills and in all parts of the laramie plains it yields dinosaur bones everywhere but by no means so profusely or so perfectly as in the two famous localities we are describing how the skeletons lie in the bluffs and quarry at the bluffs single animals lie from twenty to one hundred feet apart one rarely finds a whole skeleton such as that of marsh's brontosaurus excelsus the finest specimen ever secured here which is now one of the treasures of the yale museum more frequently a half or a third of a skeleton lies together in the bone cabin quarry on the other hand we came across a veritable noah's ark deposit a perfect museum of all the animals of the period here are the largest of the giant dinosaurs closely mingled with the remains of the smaller but powerful carnivorous dinosaurs which preyed upon them also those of the slow and heavy moving armored dinosaurs of the period as well as of the lightest and most bird-like of the dinosaurs finely rounded complete limbs from eight to ten feet in length are found especially those of the carnivorous dinosaurs perfect even to the sharply pointed and recurved tips of their toes other limbs and bones are so crushed and distorted by pressure that it is not worth while removing them sixteen series of vertebrae were found strung together among these were eight long strings of tail bones the occurrence of these tails is less surprising when we come to study the important and varied functions of the tail in these animals and the consequent connection of the tail bones by means of stout tendons and ligaments 
which held them together for a long period after death. Skulls are fragile and rare in the quarry, because in every one of these big skeletons there were no fewer than ninety distinct bones which exceeded the head in size, the excess in most cases being enormous. The bluffs appear to represent the region of an ancient shoreline, such conditions as we have depicted in the restoration of Brontosaurus, the sloping banks of a muddy estuary, or of a lagoon, either bare tidal flats or covered with vegetation. Evidently the dinosaurs were buried at or near the spot where they perished. The bone cabin quarry deposit represents entirely different conditions. The theory that it is the accumulation of a flood is, in my opinion, improbable, because a flood would tend to bring entire skeletons down together, distribute them widely, and bury them rapidly. A more likely theory is that this was the area of an old river bar, which in its shallow waters arrested the more or less decomposed and scattered carcasses which had slowly drifted downstream toward it, including a great variety of dinosaurs, crocodiles, and turtles collected from many points upstream. Thus were brought together the animals of a whole region, a fact which vastly enhances the interest of this deposit. The Giant Herbivorous Dinosaurs By far the most imposing of these animals are those which may be popularly designated as the Great or Giant Dinosaurs. The name, derived from dinos, terrible, and Soros, lizard, refers to the fact that they appeared externally like enormous lizards, with very long limbs, necks, and tails. They were actually remotely related to the Tuatera lizard of New Zealand, and still more remotely to the true lizards. No land animals have ever approached these giant dinosaurs in size, and naturally the first point of interest is the architecture of the skeleton. The backbone is, indeed, a marvel. The fitness of the construction consists, like that of the American truss bridge, in attaining the maximum of strength with the minimum of weight. It is brought about by dispensing with every cubic millimeter of bone which can be spared without weakening the vertebrae for the various stresses and strains to which they were subjected. And these must have been tremendous in an animal from 60 to 70 feet in length. The bodies of the vertebrae are of hourglass shape with great lateral and interior cavities. The arches are constructed on the T-iron principle of the modern bridge builder. The back spines are tubular. The interior is spongy, these devices being employed in great variety and constituting a mechanical triumph of size, lightness, and strength combined. Comparing a great chambered dinosaurian Camarasaurus vertebra see above, with the weight per cubic inch of an ostrich vertebra, we reach the astonishing conclusion that it weighed only 21 pounds, or half the weight of a whale vertebra of the same bulk. The skeleton of a whale 74 feet in length has recently been found by Mr. F. A. Lucas, of the Brooklyn Museum to weigh 17,920 pounds. The skeleton of a dinosaur of the same length may be roughly estimated as not exceeding 10,000 pounds. Proofs of Rapid Movements on Land Lightness of skeleton is a walking or running or flying adaptation 
and not at all a swimming one a swimming animal needs gravity in its skeleton because sufficient buoyancy in the water is always afforded by the lungs and soft tissues of the body the extraordinary lightness of these dinosaur vertebrae may therefore be put forward as proof of supreme fitness for the propulsion of an enormous frame during occasional incursions upon land there are additional facts which point to land progression such as the point in the tail where the flexible structure suddenly becomes rigid as shown in the diagram of vertebrae below the component joints are so solid and flattened on the lower surface that they seem to demonstrate fitness to support partly the body in a tripodal position like that of a kangaroo i have therefore hazarded the view that even some of these enormous dinosaurs were capable of raising themselves on their hind limbs lightly resting on the middle portion of the tail in such a position the animal would have been capable not only of browsing among the higher branches of trees but of defending itself against the carnivorous dinosaurs by using its relatively short but heavy front limbs to ward off attacks there are also indications of aquatic habits in some of the giant dinosaurs which render it probable that a considerable part of their life was led in the water one of these indications is the backward position of the nostrils many but not all water-living mammals and reptiles have the nostrils on top of the head in order to breathe more readily when the head is partly immersed another fact of note although perhaps less conclusive is the fitness of the tail for use while moving about in the water if not in rapid swimming the great tail measuring from twenty eight to thirty feet was one of the most remarkable structures in these animals and undoubtedly served a great variety of purposes propelling while in the water balancing and supporting and defending while on land in diplodocus it was most perfectly developed from its muscular base to its delicate and whip-like tip perhaps for all these functions the three kinds of giant dinosaurs it is very remarkable that three distinct kinds of these great dinosaurs lived at the same time in the same general region as proved by the fact that their remains are freely commingled in the quarry what were the differences in food and habits in structure and in gait which prevented that direct and active competition between like types in the struggle for existence which in the course of nature always leads to the extermination of one or the other type in the last three years we have discovered very considerable differences of structure which make it appear that these animals while of the same or nearly the same linear dimensions did not enter into direct competition either for food or for territory the dinosaur named diplodocus by marsh is the most completely known of the three our very first discovery in the bone cabin quarry gave us the hint that diplodocus was distinguished by relatively long slender limbs and that it may be popularly known as the long-limbed dinosaur the great skeleton found in the como bluffs enabled me to restore for the first time the posterior half of one of these animals estimated as sixty feet in length the hips and tail especially being in a perfect state of preservation 
a larger animal nearer seventy feet in length including the anterior half of the body and still more complete was discovered about ten miles north of the quarry and is now in the carnegie museum in pittsburgh combined these two animals have furnished a complete knowledge of the great bony frame the head is only two feet long and is therefore small out of all proportion to the great body the neck measures twenty one feet four inches and is by far the longest and largest neck known in any animal living or extinct the back is relatively short measuring ten feet eight inches the vertebrae of the hip measure two feet and three inches the tail measures from thirty two to forty feet we thus obtain as a moderate estimate of the total length of the animal sixty eight to seventy feet the restored skeleton published by mr j b hatcher in july nineteen o one and partly embodying our results gave to science the first really accurate knowledge of the length of these animals which hitherto had been greatly overestimated the highest point in the body was above the hips here in fact was the center of power and motion because as observed above the tail fairly balanced the anterior part of the body the restoration by mr knight is drawn from a very careful model made under my direction in which the proportions of the animal are precisely estimated it is i think accurate for a restoration as well as interesting and up to date these restorations are the working hypotheses of our science they express the present state of our knowledge and being subject to modification by future discoveries are liable to constant change by contrast the second type of giant dinosaur the brontosaurus or thundersaurian of marsh as shown in the restoration was far more massive in structure and relatively shorter in body five more or less complete skeletons are now to be seen in the yale american carnegie and field columbian museums in 1898 we discovered in the bluffs about three miles west of the bone cabin quarry the largest of these animals which has yet been found it was worked out with great care and is now being restored and mounted complete in the american museum the thigh bone is enormous measuring five feet eight inches in length and is relatively of greater mass than that of diplodocus the neck chest hips and tail are correspondingly massive the neck is relatively shorter however measuring eighteen feet while in diplodocus it measures over twenty one feet the total length of this massive specimen is estimated at sixty three feet or from six to eight feet less than the largest long-limbed dinosaur the height of the skeleton at the hips is fifteen feet there is less direct evidence that the thundersaurian had the power of raising its forequarters in the air than in the case of the light-limbed saurian because no bend or supporting point in the tail has been distinctly observed the third type of giant dinosaur is the less completely known chambered saurian the camarasaurus of cope or morosaurus of marsh an animal more quadrupedal in gait or walking more habitually on all fours like the great cediosaurus or whale saurian discovered near oxford england with its shorter tail and heavier forelimbs it is still less probable that this animal had the power of raising the anterior part of its body from the ground 
of a related type perhaps is the largest dinosaur ever found this is the brachiosaurus limb bones of which were discovered in central colorado in 1901 and are now preserved in the field columbian museum of chicago its thigh bone is six feet eight inches in length 